Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 502nd New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at the Brooklyn Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation on bodies and masks as NFTs, where art, blockchain, and capitalism collide, featuring Brendan Fernandez, Dred Scott, and Charlotte Kent. We're thrilled to have Shanika McIntosh here to conclude today's event with a poetry reading. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on the Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. Uh, Brendan is tuning in from the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. Um, these lands are also home to the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Minomini, Sac, and Fox, and others. Uh, we encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in the chat in just a moment. Uh, over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at the Rail. We will also post some more information on this in the chat in just a moment. And now to introduce today's guests and host, internationally recognized Canadian artist, Brendan Fernandez works at the intersection of dance and visual arts. Brendan's projects address issues of race, queer culture, migration, protest, and other forms of collective movement. Brendan's projects take on hybrid forms, part ballet, part queer dance hall, part politic protest, but always rooted in collaboration and solidarity. Brendan has received the Artadia Award, a Smithsonian Artist Research, Research Fellowship, and a Lewis Comfort Tiffany uh, Foundation grant. His projects have shown at the Whitney Biennial and the Guggenheim Museum, among many others. He is currently assistant professor at Northwestern University. Interdisciplinary artist Dred Scott creates work that encourages viewers to re-examine coherent ideals of American society. In 1989, the US Senate outlawed his artwork and President Bush declared it disgraceful because of its transgressive use of the American flag. Dredd became part of a landmark Supreme Court case when he and others burned flags on the steps of the Capitol about which he has presented a TED talk. In 2021, Scott received the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship and this past December, uh, Art News named his NFT white male for sale, a defining artwork of 2021 which we'll be discussing today. And last but certainly not least, our host is Assistant Professor of Visual Culture, Charlotte Kent, PhD, uh, who has a particular interest in historical frameworks for assorted practices, digital culture, and the absurd. She writes for assorted magazines and publishes her research in various academic journals and is an editor at large here at the Brooklyn Row. So without further ado, Charlotte, passing you the mic. Thank you so much um, to everyone. And thank you, Brendan and Dredd, for joining the conversation today. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you about your experiences and these projects. Um, to start with, actually, I think we should look and engage with these projects directly. Um, so I was wondering if um, we can ask each of you to do that, maybe for a few minutes each. And I believe that there's a slideshow that's ready to go to help us visualize some of this. So Brendan, um, I guess going in uh, alphabetical order seems like one way to go. Uh, Brendan, would you be willing to start, please? Yes, totally. Uh, thanks so much, Nick and Charlotte and Dredd. It's so good to see you again. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Souvenir. Um, Souvenir uh, started um, as a way to think about um, a project I started in New York in 2008 that was an exhibition at Art in General. Um, and being of Kenyan um, Indian descent, uh, and this is these were the neons that I made for that exhibition. When I was I just moved to New York and I was thinking a lot about the idea of, of migration and movement and how uh, on Canal Street, um, outside of the Whitney Independent Studies Studios, um, West African mass, um, West African um, 
immigrants were selling masks as New York souvenirs. And I was really curious about this notion of, of this, this, this object, this artifact in a museum that how it becomes a commodity and how with it, in that commodity, it also becomes a stand-in for a cultural signifier of being African, but also in this space, um, a New York souvenir. And I was questioning my own identity and space uh, and like, who was I in, in this new space of New York? And who am I as a Kenyan Indian, as a queer identifying person? And so this kind of idea of multiplicity, this idea that you know objects can have many 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 residues as a dancer i think a lot about how these objects have been stilled how they came with dances in their original form of content and context but in you know the museum collections we've taken them from their place of origin and removed the body we've removed the dancing the the, the, the traditional cultural rituals that go with them so when i started thinking about nfts i think a lot about community i think about um a way to support um, dancers, a way to support, um, you know, um, a culture. I thought that a way to do it was in this um, in in this idea of coming back to the mask and creating this notion of a mask that is constantly in transformation, a mask that is, you know, living in the metaverse that is is giving itself movement and is sort of dancing in this way. And through this, I started thinking about, you know, again, the community aspect of like, how does one create a new identity. Identity for me is something that's constantly in flux, constantly in change. Um, and so the mask itself is playing on that idea that it is, you know, when you when you mint one, it uses an algorithm to kind of create different um, different um, aspects of, 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 of uh, an object. So that I have three masks that are originally based and, and placed in the Metropolitan Museum collection. Their counterparts as souvenirs are sold on Canal Street. And then you have the neon versions that become art objects, but here they become this ephemeral object, this object that is constantly in change, in flux, and dance for me is ephemeral. So we've taken away the body, we've taken away the dance, but in this project, we're trying to reinvent them, reinstate them as they kind of move and perform in the metaverse. And one of the things about, you know, souvenir, which was interesting and the nft and the crypto native community is that it's about building solidarity it's about supporting each other and i like the structure of of potential revenue that it kind of gives back it challenges the ways that we're thinking about uh you know the art world you know when you buy when someone's a museum or a collector buys something we as artists are removed and so i'm thinking about ways to be to find solidarity to support dancers a part of my my mint of souvenir was to create a dancers fund, a fund that would then continue to support and allow dancers to um, to generate, um, you know, revenue for them, but also to create um, a foundation eventually where I can then support dancers through space, through through uh, health insurance, through just paying dancers. This idea that our labor is seen as being invisible, our labor is, you know, seems effortless, but we are through through our work, we are constantly in, a, in, a, in an action. We're constantly laboring. And so that's, you know, the kind of capitalist kind of like counter that we are, you know, our labor is not valued. And so I really wanted to challenge this through souvenir. And, you know, it's a little a bit cheeky. I, I'm working with like shells and within West African culture, shells are seen as a sense of currency. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the object itself is made out of like a, 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 a currency, which then is also, you know, placed against, you know, this idea of a cryptocurrency. So there's these moments of, of, of question, this moments of challenge, but within it, it's meant to bring community and solidarity through a dance space, but also through, you know, a crypto native space and the metaverse. So how do we dance together in the metaverse? How do we gather? And in a place, you know, a time of pandemic, we gather through screens. We're now all together in a space that is digital. It's a safe space. It's a brave space. And I'm thinking about that, you know, when the pandemic happened, uh, all of my work is about gathering critical mass about bodies being together. And that was put into question. And at a time, I didn't know how to make performance work anymore. And I was also really questioning this idea of like, how do I still support my community? How do I support my dancers? And so this project kind of came through the thinking of, you know, not being able to be together. And so I really am curious about the structures, the dismantling of, of hegemony through crypto um, uh, crypto space and the metaverse. So I'll leave it at that and then we can go into more discussion. Leave it at that. That's a lot to leave. Um, but I know we're gonna pick up a lot of those strands uh, 
throughout this conversation. So Dred, um, would you be willing to speak a little bit to your project that you did? No, I was just going to be a face on the screen. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll talk uh, uh, about my project. The project uh, the, uh, is called White Mail for Sale. And it is an NFT that exists both as a one minute, 10 second looped video of a white man on an auction block in a black neighborhood, as well as an auction of that, of that uh, loop video that took place at Christie's. Um, and so at a certain point, oh, oh good, we're gonna play a little bit of the video, that's great. Um, and the video can just play, it's silent, um, so it can just play while I'm, I'm talking. Um, and so, uh, and for those who don't, I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with your screen. You don't need to adjust your, your dial that is playing at, at a slow speed. Um, and, and that's intentional. So, I mean, I learned of NFTs probably about the same time the vast majority of us did. And that's when Beeple's artwork sold for $69 million at a Christie's auction last year. And um, when I heard about that, I mean, I was like, this is interesting. One of the things that um, stood out for me, which is probably different than most people, is the, the term non-fungible token. Most, I would say, sort of middle-class people in the United States or people who speak English have probably heard the term fungible, but they haven't used it in a sentence probably in, in many, many years. Um, but as somebody whose artwork is, a lot of it addresses the question of enslavement, um, I read a lot about slavery. And one of the things that a lot of scholars, uh, Seti Hartman and many other scholars have been looking at for the past you know, 20 years now is the term fungible and, and talking about the fungibility of black bodies. And one of the things that was very specific is that the Portuguese and the Spanish around the, the late 14 and early 1500s started to try and, and sort of merge capitalism with slavery with production agriculture or plantation agriculture and specifically, they needed to turn people into commodities and commodities that were fungible. For those who don't know, fungible basically means functionally equivalent. And so the, the dollar in my pocket is basically equivalent to the dollar in your pocket. Anybody who accepts dollars will view them as the same, even though there might be slightly different numbers on each piece of paper. But they're, they're tradable and they're equivalent. Um, people are inherently not fungible. Um, but in the times of slavery, the Portuguese came up with this system called a piece of India, whereby if you were trying to purchase people, um, you, if you were a, a, had a plantation, say, in Brazil, and you were trying to purchase people to work on your plantation, you wouldn't purchase um, 100 people. You'd request to buy 100 pieces of India. A piece of India was a unit of measure that was used for, uh, basically, it was an idea, a unit that was an idealized slave, male age 16 to 25, um, that was healthy. And so actual enslaved people were compared to this idealized slave. And so people might be worth a full, full um, piece of India, or they might be worth less than that. They might be a two thirds or one third, say an unhealthy male, maybe he caught yellow fever, would be worth maybe a third of a piece of India, and a female with perhaps a child might be worth uh, two thirds or something like that. So if you were this enslaver that were trying to trying to have people on your plantation, um, you would purchase 100 pieces of India and you might get 130 people. And you would take these actual human beings that, that you had fantasies about what you can make them do and make them do actual things, but you bought pieces of India. In America, the slave traders, they would have uh, records for people wanting to purchase number one or number two or number three slaves. And so again, these were these idealized abstracted notions of, 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 of a slave that real actual unique discrete individuals were compared against. And so when I wanted to make an NFT and respond to the fact that a thoroughly sexist and racist artwork that people had made sold for $69 million, I wanted to talk about the roots of capitalism and enslavement and how capitalism turns everything into commodities. And it was sort of reinventing itself, doing it with art. And so, and right now we're looking at a poster uh, for, that, that was an, an ad that was made for uh, the auction um, of, of white mail for sale to, to advertise that this was happening. And so it took a, a traditional uh, poster that would be made or advertisement that would be made for selling uh, Negroes and flipped it. And so instead of to be sold uh, a cargo of 94 prime healthy Negroes, this was a cargo of prime healthy whites. Um, and so then if we can get the next image, 
um, we could see that indeed at a certain point on October 1st, 2021, uh, the Christie's auction house said, I have a white male available for sale. I can accept bidding at $25,000. And the, 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 the NFT was auctioned off. So one of the things that I think we need to, to sort of just also make transparent is that when people talk about, I made an NFT, it's very, it's often what that is is sort of obfuscated. What is an actual NFT? And actually an NFT is just a record on a blockchain um, that has ownership and points to a folder somewhere on the internet, which is why you could have 5,000 artworks of Beeple, 5,000 JPEGs, that is an NFT. You could also have a tweet from Melania, I mean, a tweet from uh, Jack Dorsey that is an that is an NFT. You can have a uh, product from Melania Trump that's an NFT, or you can have sort of collectibles that are NFTs, or you can have artwork that's an NFT. All of this can be, and I think one of the things that gets collapsed in everybody's recent sort of tech bros encouraging us to talk about NFTs is that we're talking about very different things. More than likely, Jack Dorsey's tweet is not going to hang in a museum. And frankly, except for the fact that it sold for $69 million, neither is Beeple's artwork. Um, and so the, the thing is, the, the, there's a huge, tremendous amount of speculation that's driven by, um, uh, you know, sort of crypto enthusiasts and tech bros that, um, you know, is getting people to think about NFTs in a way that sort of some artists are thinking, hey, maybe we can get in on this game but it is a complex game that is not just one particular thing. And a lot of it actually isn't art, but it all gets merged together. And so I was trying to sort of bring, make a conceptual artwork that actually is an NFT that talks about and, and critiques and, and, and gets people to think about the origins of, of capitalism and enslavement and what capitalism is. So I'll leave it at that and then we can have a discussion. Thank you. So, there's a lot to address here. And I think, you know, both of you are looking at issues around capitalism and, and markets and labor um, and the way in which art gets mixed up with that, right? And the way in which art winds up becoming a sign often for these large economic and political activities. Um, it struck me in the time that I spent work engaging with both of your projects um, that have these sort of strong visual components um, that are clearly intent, like carefully crafted, right? Um, the importance also of performance and performativity. And that was a really interesting moment for me because it made me start thinking, you know, we talk about blockchain in terms of its you know, immutability and its transparency and all of this is sort of rhetoric around blockchain. And then we talk about it in terms of the speculation and the finance markets. And we talk about it in terms of platforms and technologies. But what both of your projects also wound up doing for me is revealing the way in which it is a theater of and for technology. And I thought that was, this, you know, the, the, the way in which you were able to sort of bring that to light, I thought was really interesting because it allowed me to think about the way in which blockchain really represents and is operating as a space in which to investigate the theater of technology, um, which most of us haven't gotten a chance to do. And so I thought just as a general place to start, what was it like to engage with this theater, to bring your work into this space that has such a spotlight on it right now? You want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, it was really, um, well, first of all, a learning and, and, and an education for myself, but then it also like working with um, a, a physical gallery here in Chicago called I'm Not Art and learning about the community of crypto natives to kind of understand that there is an already existing community that, you know, understands, but doesn't understand me fully as the art world and so this kind of this exchange of, of going back and forth and for me that was really important to 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 show that I was wanting to be part of this this system and this 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 structure but to show that I also was not just coming into it for uh, you know like superficial capitalist reasons and so there was a lot of communicating a lot of understanding and then 
And so there was a constant like dialogue. And I think that is an important space to be in. Uh, and for me, it was it was a learning space. Uh, I had I was I was coming into it for the first time and almost like proving that I am doing this for a specific purpose and not just because of capital to find about, you know, for me, again, learning that people were supporting each other in this kind of structure was really important that then made me want to invest more. I was like, okay, then I want to kind of understand this, this, this process and do it more because it can also help within a greater community, community to find solidarity. So that for me was the kind of thing that was, was the beginning to, to really kind of like invest within this community. I, I think I took a slightly different approach. I mean, I, I'm well aware that there's a lot of communities that are interested in this space, a lot of communities I would have a lot of alignment and affinity with that. And I think, Brendan, your project of trying to find a way to finance you know, dancers is, and is really smart and incredible. Um, but I think my, my approach has been to, to look at this. I mean, capitalism has not been a benevolent force in the world. It's actually pretty terrible. And this reinvention or, or, you know, capitalism on steroids that where venture capitalists is throwing literally millions and millions, billions of dollars at trying to get people invested in crypto um, and, and to try and get sort of a new base to, to turn crypto into art in a certain sense is not something that I, I mean, this is something we should approach with a lot of caution and a little bit of analysis. I mean, it's, I've never seen you know, capitalism really work for the people. It might work for a few individuals, including people that I like, but as, as a, a model, it's not good and it's not gonna work out well. And, and so when I saw what was happening where there was like this tremendous sum of money thrown at an artist that is outside of the, the main space where art that I'm interested in exists in and got elevated through a space that then is intersecting with an art world that I am interested in and sort of where, I mean, frankly, the, you know, the fact that Beeple is more valuable than say, Carrie James Marshall is something that should give those of us who know who Carrie James Marshall is and like his work a lot of pause about why we're so excited about, hey, NFTs are gonna be this transformative thing. Cause I think that, you know, much like we were sold, oh, you know, ride sharing is gonna be a thing that transforms um, you know, access to cars or how, you know, vacation sharing is gonna transform how things, you know, how people have access to travel you know, Airbnb and, and Uber have not really been turned out to be the benevolent forces that their founders try, tried to market it as. And I think that NFTs are the same way. We, we who are actual artists that are doing substantive, rigorous, you know, community oriented and, and conceptual work are also swimming in the same pool as some people who have our values and ideas that are antithetical to what we're about. And so I wanted to make work that called that out. My initial approach to it, I was, I mean, you know, the white mail for sale didn't get auctioned until October of last year, but it was ready to go about three weeks after Beeple and we couldn't get Christie's to move quickly enough. And it would have been, I think, a more interesting conceptual conversation engaging with the social question of what, what NFTs are right at the moment. Everybody was suddenly grappling with it. And that was, as a conceptual artist was more the intent. Um, and so, yeah, that's... Yeah, just to like, have, go ahead, please, Brendan. Just to quickly follow up, you know, I think that that's, you know, I, um, you know, I definitely think that this this space of capitalism is something that we need to dismantle. That. And for me, working within the NFT system is a way of using it, like finding, uh, using and 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 finding like protests from within the system. So like using it to benefit for for us because it, we're we're in the space where we're we're. we're we're working within it and it's not functioning. So how do we find change from within? And that's kind of was my way of dismantling and thinking about this 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 NFT system where the structure is kind of saying like, okay, we're gonna like reevaluate the structure that yes, there is capital involved, but the capital can be distributed to, to a greater space. And that for me was something that was was really interesting to kind of think through um, this this idea of like, how do we find change from within a system? I mean, your project and, and Glenn Taino's project, you know, with, with uh, uh, Tommy Smith and that, that is, you know, activating an NFT to try and fund social justice work. I mean, I think that's doing that and that's good, but I think we always need to be, you know, we are probably at this point more useful to the tech bros that are crypto enthusiasts than they, than they are to us. And, and even if you happen to be able to set up a, 
a, you know, a foundation that has, uh, is well financed and that's great for you and the people it affects. The bigger question is how do we engage? I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm culpable. I made an NFT too. It's not like I stood by the side and said Jacques Hughes. It's, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware that, that, you know, that, that in order to engage that space critically, one has to enter into the space. But I also think that that those of us who are not you and me who are like in, engaging it that way, there are a lot of other people who are just like, hey, this is a way I can make money um, as an artist. And it's like, well, maybe you can. And if you do, great. But there's all this, all these other layers, including, you know, the performative technology that, that Charlotte was talking about that I think, you know, we need to, you know, th there's, there's not enough dissenting and critical voices talking about this. And, and I think there needs to be a lot more because otherwise we will end up, you know, you know, one or two of us will be big NFT stars and the rest of the people will get screwed over as we always have been. And we'll be right back where we started. Only some of us will have sold out others of us. I mean, I want to just sort of throw a couple of things into the mix here, because this is an important conversation in the sense that we've talked a lot over the last year um, about the way, you know, art is, actually for a while, about the way the arts are not funded, about um, the precariousness of many artists' lives. Um, I think it's worth mentioning in particular the way in which dancers, um, uh, I think there's some information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on the degree to which the incredibly low rate that um, many dancers get paid. Um, it's, and I was thinking about all this because of course, this is, that's part of the sort of dream of blockchain, right? Or like in this NFT space, it's like somehow this is going to like equalize, it's gonna, re, it's gonna somehow alter the financial landscape and make it possible for people to gain, to be remunerated that have not previously been. Um, I was speaking earlier with someone, 78% of people whose income is under $50,000 a year are unbanked. And I think one of the things, and most artists, <laughs> according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, make under $50,000 a year, right? So it, it's, it's interesting to think about the way in which that, that precarity that so many artists feel has been, I think to Dred's point, used as a way to get people involved in another financial system that it has assorted risks involved with it. And that is still very novel and is still being explored. And the way in which um, it hasn't, we have yet to see how much it's going to be able to do. On the other side of it, the technology itself, to Brendan's point, has certain features that haven't existed before, which can kind of automate a type of remuneration, especially in the context where like choreographers and dancers are the ones who make a dance become a great success and then never see any of those rewards, right? Um, I think what it becomes apparent in this space is the way in which all of us who are participating in an artist in particular are producing labor to enable a new financial system right that the, that the labor of our of the of the nfts that are produced the labor of interaction on the space the dialogues that we're having around this like i get torn because every time i have a conversation about this i enable something i'm not totally convinced by yet i'm curious about it i don't think it's going anywhere but i'm i'm concerned and that's what brings me to the conversation around labor that both of you are talking about, right? Which is, what is it about blockchain in particular that cultivates or even demands a conversation around labor? There's other technologies, there's VR, there's, you know, like mobile technology, like, but why blockchain? Why does blockchain ask for the conversation around labor to occur? That's for either of you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that blockchain, in and of itself, asks for the 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 conversation around labor to occur. Blockchain, as a technology, enables lots of different things. Some of which are actually really cool. Um, but I think that you know, the, one of the main ways in which blockchain can ask for that conversation is that you can both have you know smart contracts and other. You can actually you know. S 
you can enable a way for people in a decentralized way, including those that are unbanked, as long as you have you know, electricity and a crypto wallet, um, to have all sorts of people in a distributed way, you know, sort of remunerate them or including even with, with other, with DAOs and stuff to actually have communities, you know, vote up uh, sort of social action and or remuneration for individuals. I mean, I think there are ways in which blockchain can automate some of that and that and having that conversation about who gets paid, how they get paid, who needs to know that they're paid, how it's accessible for them to get paid. Those are all interesting things, but there are many other things that blockchain can do. I mean, there are you know, banks that are interested in blockchain because it, it can actually you know, sort of replace their record checking system with one that is distributed, distributed and decentralized, which is kind of interesting because part of why at least Bitcoin and blockchain around Bitcoin was created was because some of the people who you know were at least early proponents and possibly the creators of it were very wary of governments and banks controlling and regulating currency and having a, a say over who who can exchange and trying to to basically have um, you know people who do, do the work re, you know register the transaction on the blockchain and so um, it's interesting that blocks are like banks are hey we can get in on this and that's not in and of itself a question of labor but that is a question. Of, of capital and is the question of, of you know who who controls who controls how labor is compensated these days um, in a certain sense. But I, I do think that there you know blockchain can be used to make sure healthcare gets assigned to the right place. I mean there are a lot of different things blockchain technology can do, not all of which have to do with labor or even you know payment or, or payment systems or contracts. And so I think we should sort of disaggregate what what we're talking about, what aspects of blockchain might be applicable to a conversation about labor and what is just an, another thing of technology. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Dred there. And I think one of the things about blockchain that is, again, going back to this, the structural system is that it creates agency, it creates, it, it creates value, it creates visibility. And I'm thinking specifically in the context of like, you know, of dancers where our labor is ephemeral. And so there's a sense that there's a sustainability that we can continue within the work even after the performance is is over and so i think that that kind of space of giving a sustainability a contents of 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 a increased agency that the work will continue to to gain value is really important so it's not necessarily the blockchain but i think it's the the idea that there is this the structure in place that will allow for the the work to be still seen and and giving it value it I hear that. I wonder about it, though, in the sense that, I mean, this, this distributed technology that allows for this kind of automation is also dealing with a world in which, you know, we've been having these conversations around compensation for a while. Um, and I can't help but think about the way in which it is a part of this whole sort of Web3 world that is starting to be imagined, and that uh as certain types of physical labor are have been, and have been devalued for several decades now and sort of offshored and, and you know been been marginalized or you know made less visible um that there there's something around this technology that is about trying to like there's there's a kind of battle here between the sort of obfuscation of labor and and, and a need to remunerate labor um, that I think both of you, I mean, both of your projects are sort of getting at it in different ways. And I think one of the things that's interesting, I mean, just to get it back from the sort of vague space that I'm in right now is that has to do with um, artists do this work, right? Like I, I'm always pointing out the fact that like bankers were in this space for a while, the cryptocurrency people have been here for a while, but these conversations happen with artists, like artists are the ones who raise the flag and help us see these things. And I just, I guess the question I wanted to ask you both is, This sort of brings the first and second question together is like when you entered this space, how how did people respond to your entering this space? Right. I mean, you're you're both like Brendan, you spoke about like engaging this audience that was there, but like also you're 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 in these two worlds, right? So like how what was the reaction to that? Because it is a theater in that sense, and it is a labor practice for both of you. 
So I'm just curious how people responded to the fact that you produced these projects. Well, I think for me initially, you know, I, I spoke about the the findings and the ex exchanges between you know crypto natives, and then but within the art world, there was a lot of kind of like interest and confusion as well. Like being like, like, what is this? Like, I keep on getting asked all the time, like, what is an NFT? And then it was like, well, you know, like there was this sort of like thing. It was like, well, how do I get one? If I get one, then do I do I print it? Do I how do I display it? And I was like, you know, part of why I was also interested conceptually as an artist is that it isn't. A commodity in that way it is but it isn't and i love that, that that space of flux because that's how i define myself you know within queerness within the the the, the possibilities of how who i am as a, as a person i'm always in flux even when i make performances in in the live in the real they're not you know on stage they're <clears throat> they're gatherings they're on the street so there, there's never a full definition so that was something that was curious for me but within that trying to define it it was also then it, it was still it still needs that it kind of reminded me a little bit of you know video art when people were like you're making film and video like what is that like you know so there's this kind of education and educational way of trying to like to tell people like what this was one thing i was thinking about though is you know this idea of finding new forms and new ways you know it's still experimentation like i'm also educating myself through the process of making one and the first you know creation and then the first drop was definitely something that i was like you know i i was going through the process as i'm also trying to educate people and um i think that was something that was really interesting but for me again like you know to commodify an archive dance through an NFT was also something that was interesting to me because you know it's you know museums are always asking like how do we how do we collect performance art how do we collect you know this this how do we archive performance you know like to create a legacy as well there's a sense of that within this process that I'm also kind of intrigued in is how do we then find a way to commodify it to support and sustain um, you know dancers choreographers other artists but also like, you know, how do we archive it? But for me, it was definitely a, a space of trying to educate um, and, and definitely maneuvering two different worlds, the art world and then the crypto native world for sure. You know, I, I think, um, I mean, actually, there's a, a, I, mean, I want to answer the question, but I do have um, this thing of, I think artists, including those of us who make ephemeral work, because a fair amount of my work is performance-based. And the question Brandon was just talking about is, is important for museums. How do, how, do we, how do we collect this? How do we preserve it? Um, how do we re represent it? Um, that, that's a question, but this question of commodification, I mean, I, I sell artwork, I sell objects, I'm willing to sell performances and videos, but I, I don't, I don't think we should be trying to figure out how to commodify our art in a certain sense. I think we should be fine figuring out how artists can have sustainable existence and support in an ongoing way our art. But I think that one of the things that I actually like about art is the aesthetic and the ideas as opposed to what did something sell for, which is I think there's a lot in this society you know, you hear about a film that opens, you, we don't hear whether the film was any good, we hear what its opening box office weekend gross was. Or, you know, when somebody says, hey, you know, I, I heard you're going to Art Basel or Freeze, what, is, what were the sales like? Which is like, that's not why I'm interested in art. And I don't think it's actually why, Brendan, you're interested as you should, you know, and, and it's like, I'm, and so artists, when we get, get cooked into, we got to com commodify this shit, we got to make our own brand, we got to, I mean, that's actually, that's a, that's somebody else's language and it's actually distorting our aesthetic, I think. But the question of when I got into to this and people, people's reaction are like, Dread, you're doing an NFT? I mean, it was some of this like, what, what is an NFT and how can I get one? But it's like, why you? And a lot of, and then, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people, since I've made one, I think, you know, it's a double-edged thing because I think more people, I mean, I've sort of, blessed the space somewhat when and i i'm not opposed to making nfts and i mean i thought i'd probably only make one and i i'm considering making a second one but you know i i, I 
you know, as I said earlier, I think people should be far more skeptical and critical in our approach to this because in all honesty, you know, what we're talking about as NFTs is not what Melania Trump is talking about with NFTs or what Jack Dorsey or the N NBA or all those other people that are making NFTs or even some of the crypto native people who largely they're more talking about collectibles, which is fine if people want to make and trade collectibles. That's fine. There, I mean, it's you know, there's an artist I'm friends with, a guy named Ron English, who's a pop surrealist and street artist, and he's you know, some of his he also makes a lot of collectibles, and so that for his work, there's a lot of overlap with his actual physical collectibles, which are you know, lunch boxes and dolls and stuff like that, and NFTs, which you know are are you know traded as collectibles and and increase in value like that. I think that's fine if that's what you're into, but I just think that all these things are very different social things. And so we should, you know, you know, if if artists can find ways to make NFTs useful either conceptually or financially, okay, fine. But I think we should we need to have a much more nuanced discussion about even what these damn things are. And and you know, when you know, when pe people's response was like, why did you make an NFT? I mean, I sort of said, well, because it's a social question and artists like myself need to comment on it, but that doesn't mean I'm like, hey, let's make a lot of NFTs, um, which isn't to say let's make no NFTs. But I, I also think that, that um, you know, I, as a general rule, I, I hate them. I think they're terrible, even though I might continue to make one or two more. I mean, I think one of the things you're bringing up is this issue of vocabulary. We don't really have vocabulary around a lot of this yet. I mean, people throw around NFT art, crypto art, you know, these terms as if they're, you know, as if they're all the same. I mean, I've had numerous conversations with people where we try and like identify these distinctions, right, between the collectibles and the nifty art and the crypto art and um, you know, I'll admit that I try and hold on to the language of blockchain art to sort of speak to the art that is trying to deal with the nature of the technology and the, and the sort of social politics of this emergent technology as a way to kind of distinguish from pictures or, you know, this kind of thing. And it's not a great term because as you said, Dread, like, Sometimes we're not talking about the blockchain overall, we're talking about NFTs, right? So, you know, how to deal with that, I think, is a problem. Um, I think one of the things that has been really obvious from the start, and I will say that even though we recognize that there was a start before this uh, sexist, racist uh, sale that happened, um, is that yet again, despite the fact that this is supposed to be an equitable space where anyone can participate. Um, there is just an incredibly obvious marginalization of non-cis white head males. Um, I mean, just the, even when art projects sell for a lot of money, right? So like the classic example I use is when Ixchel sold a work for 500 ETH last spring. So big sale numbers, right? There should have been a lot of attention around it very little got covered about her project. Um, and so there's a problem in the space for all that it speaks to being equitable. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why, what about the space, this theater, as I've begun to think about it, is reiterating that. I mean, I, I could make a guess and it really is a guess, but it's like, you know, the people that are driving the conversation around NFTs are tech bros and venture capitalists. I mean, that's that's a large, I mean, the, you know, that's a lot about what this is about, the, the all the excitement and enthusiasm. It wasn't as if like art world collectors said, hey man, this guy Beeple's doing something really interesting. Let's get in on this. It was some people in that space who were like, man, what if we could convince the rest of the world to get NFTs and get a bunch of Ether and Bitcoin? And that would be good for us. It would rate, you know, it would, you know, be a new all time high for, for, you know, my, my, uh, for ETH or whatever. And so I, I think that they're not interested. I mean, if, you know, an, somebody that's not a white boy, like makes an NFT, that's not going to be, you know, front page news. That's not, you know, that's not the people who were writing about that. And I mean, and that's, you know, um, I mean, I, you know, this equitable space, I mean, I just think people, it was like, come on. Now. I mean, even, even on the surface, 
you know, you, I mean, price of ETH fluctuates a lot, but to, to mint an NFT, you know, depending on what day you're talking about is a couple hundred bucks and you have to have access to electricity. I mean, large parts of the world don't have, you know, stable, I mean, so it's like, okay, you have to have computers and or, you know, cell phone access to the internet. I mean, there are all these different things in this so-called equitable space that many people just don't have. So which people are we talking about that it's equitable amongst? And then even once you cross all those barriers, as you pointed out, well, you know, one artist you know, sells for a bunch of money, not news, not really celebrated. Another artist sells for a bunch of money. Oh, yeah, man, this is what we got to make more of. And if you, you know, look at a lot of what's in that space, it's not good. There's a, I mean, it's like, you know, if they're 25 year old straight white guys that, that, you know, haven't had a date in a while got to make a bunch of art. Well, that's what a lot of NFTs are. And it's not all of what they are, but that's what a lot of them are. And, you know, it's like, that's not something that I'm super interested in promoting, but that is what they are super interested in. It's like, what if Mark Zuckerberg get, gets to promote, you know, the next new thing? Oh, wait, it's, it's meta, but before that, it, what it would be M NFTs, it's not going to be a good world. And, and that's what, you know, those are the people that are, the, I think, a lot of the drivers of this. Again, this is a guess. I mean, somebody might come on and say, well, actually, here are the people that are writing the press on this, and, and I'd have to defer to that. But I kind of think that the, the, a lot of the money and influence that's behind this is, you know, people who are trying to pump up their portfolios and drive, you know, uh, crypto to a new all-time high. Yeah, I would agree on that as well. I think that, you know, it's definitely... Um, you know, a tech broke, um, cis male, white world. And, and that's where, again, sometimes, you know, I have to like prove them and, and speak to what I do as an artist conceptually. And, and you know, because I, within the idea of, of NFT, I'm trying to kind of like dismantle and, and think about these, these spaces. And I think that that's definitely something that is a challenge. And I think what we do right now, even in this space, is finding criticality, right? We're, we're looking at it and, and talking about it and being, you know, um, sensitive to, to the issues that surround us, but also within it, we're, we're making a conversation that's different from what's actually happening in that, in that other, in the, in the origins of it, I guess I should say. I mean, I think the issue around accessibility is huge here, right? Because, I mean, it's, it's no small thing that not only do you have to have access to electricity and to the technology, but also to the funds and so forth. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning um, her story Dow, is specifically tried to address that by recognizing that, you know, there was a need for uh, black female artists to get support around this kind of thing and to learn about these technologies and to learn how to use them. And I think one of the things that's interesting about that example is the way in which it's it's this issue right now of like here's this thing and it exists and it, it it's not it has been built and it is simply growing and so um how do we get participation to shift the value system within it um and i think that's one of the things that both of your projects speak to brendan yeah, and this idea of accessibility, you know, even just the idea of, you know, Red mentioned like internet, to have internet, to have electricity, um, but even the idea of like how to make a crypto wallet, like there's, there's, it's not just something simple and easy to do and then to have to buy um, ether and, you know, and there's, there's a lot of complexity to that idea of finding accessibility and something that I found through, you know, my NFT was that it was trying to educate like the art world collectors um, through this gallery system where I'm like, well, how do we then also get it to educate and also allow others to mint outside of that art world and crypto native system? Because that was something that was, you know, not the main object for me. It was to also like give them to my my dance friends, to give them to community so that we can then, then and, but they were like, well, how do I get it then? So then it became like me doing like step by step, like I have PDF forms to be like, this is how we do it. This is how we open up a, a, a crypto wallet. Uh, and then I'll, I'll mint one and give it to you. And it was a, a way to support people at the community as well. But it was also like, it was a process where it was, it was definitely had, you know, the accessibility was definitely complicated and still one that I'm trying to, to navigate and grapple with. I think, uh, did, we, did you want to say something? Uh, I, I wanted to actually come back a little bit. I had a question for Brendan. It's like, 
this question of, of sort of supporting artists and a community and dancers in an ongoing way and having work live on. I have a question that, I mean, it's, why is an NFT a better way to do that than say a website that has artwork on it that has you know a video of your dance with a Patreon support button or something or donate button, including perhaps even a donate before you can see more than 10 seconds of it. Why, why is the, the blockchain and or NFT model better? Why does that serve you better potentially? Well, and I've done the other side and it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't contributed like it has, but it hasn't been that fast. I think there's this buzz around the NFT and that you can, if you get this with the unknowingness was there's, there's also like excitement. So people were like, okay. And then that there's this, you know, even within it, like it's like an addition, there's a thousand, but like there was this, and it also disseminated to a larger community. Like, you know, it, it kind of brought in new voices, new people to try to understand. And so that for me was, was interesting that it was allowing different platforms, different communities to, to understand it. So it was reaching a greater space where, you know, when I've done like, you know, a GoFundMe or something, it just, still, it, was, it was more insular. So for me, this kind of tried to kind of break that, um, that space and make it uh, a more, a greater space. And again, it was definitely like the, the buzzing of what is an NFT. Like people were like, Brennan, you made an NFT. Like, you know, you're a dance person. Like, what does this mean? You know, like it was, it was the challenge of, of your, you make performance art, you know? And again, you know, I'm always trying to experiment. My, my work is never bound by medium. It's, you know, it, I make dance, but I make films, I make prints, I make sculptures. So it was like, let's try something new. It's, let's figure this out as well. And as I said, it is experimentation. Like, I'm not sure if I'll make another one. I And, you know, you said you kind of hate them, but you might make another one. I'm like, sometimes I hate making art. You know, it's the same thing. Um, sometimes I'm just kind of annoyed. I wake up and I'm like, why did I choose this? You know, but it's something that I'm dedicated to. You know, art is a commodity and NFT is a commodity. So I'm working in, in a commodity-based business all the time. I'm just trying to do a different way of making it now. So if you hate making art, should we, we we each take a vow, we'll never make another work again and watch the value of our work shoot up. You heard it here on, on Brooklyn Rail, two artists <laughs> retire. <laughs> it's the comeback works that really then sort of soar in price, right? Um, I mean, I think one of the things that is, you know, so appreciated about your work and speaks to the way in which you're both artists and, you know, I'm, I guess I'm doing that elitist thing where I'm like, this is art and that's not art, but okay, here I am, I'm doing it. Um, which is to say that, you know, in both of your instances, the NFTs you produced are extensions of a longstanding practice, right? And I think that that's something that people forget and that is, is part of like what we value over here in our little insular, apparently elitist our world. I have never been so in favor of this sort of like world except since all this happened because I actually think there's huge values and that some of the you know horrible gatekeepers actually wind up doing really helpful explanatory supportive work on behalf of artists and art projects um uh, anyway I digress the thing I wanted to ask about though is just you're both being historical right you're both reaching into history and trying to bring that history into this space. And I think, um, you know, you're speaking to different parts of history, you're speaking to, you know, different parts of art history, you're speaking to the way art history has been, you know, tied up with reinforcing certain types of markets. I mean, that's absolutely true. You know, you're speaking to, I mean, I just wanted to pause you and say, like, I think it's really important to recognize that Brendan's works were these neon works, right, using electricity, and then you produce this generative art project. Again, like, it's like this it's this next approach to electricity and how electricity is being used and manifested in art right i think it's interesting that you know dread you're, you're stuck on this word and how this word really speaks to a type of narrowing of history um that gets ignored and gets forgotten i can't help but just say this technology has a lot of excitement. Brendan pointed that out, right? Like the Patreon button doesn't do the same thing. It doesn't do the same thing because there isn't the interest in it. Um, I, we've had conversations around the fact that 20 years ago when the internet started to get you know, interested, artists made work about 
how just the internet itself had certain types of you know racial language around it like it had this whole sort of colonialist imperialist like you know navigating and exploring and you know it was a, you know, we're using that language here with the wild west right it's like oh it's the wild west like sorry but the wild west actually had communities and you know societies and political functions and like there was a lot going on there i guess i'm i'm curious how whether you think there can be the potential to actually historicize here, like whether these histories you're bringing in, not saying, but we do it even when it does, even when we think it will fail, right? That's part of what we can do as art, you know, as artists. But like, do you think that can be heard? The blockchain is immutable. In theory, history will never be forgotten in the blockchain space. But do you think that that actually can happen here? Um. Do you have any floppy disks? Can you read them? I mean, the blockchain is not that immutable. It might be around, you know, if we're lucky, some new iteration of it'll be there 20, 25 years. But there's, you know, talk to a conservator. This blockchain stuff is has not been figured out. And, you know, you can pick up a, a book from, a you know, several hundred years ago. And if you can read the language, you can read it. But anything that's tech-based, that tech changes really quick. And, and what is today's immutable is tomorrow, like, I don't even know how to plug it in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, so I think that's one issue that we should, you know, just be aware of that, you know, the, the, the technology changes really quick. And the other thing is, you know, this, I think that those that are talking about history and being critical, by and large, we are going to get subsumed by whatever blockchain and NFT becomes. I mean, we are, I mean, yeah, we're talking to 45 people now and, and you know, we're, we have outsized, I mean, Brendan and I are, you know, you invited us and you wanted to come here, uh, you know, what wisdom we would drop on you. And that might even become like a, a, a recorded Zoom thing that other people will click at. And we have disproportionate influence relative to say other people in the arts, but this the, the, the crypto and NFT is way, way, way bigger than either the two of us or more importantly than the art world. We're, we are minor players. We are very minor players. And I think that, that whatever we're thinking about history and how this is historicized, I think a couple projects might get, you know, sort of well known amongst the art community and, and written into art history and, and museums. But by and large, this is going to get ground up in, in the advance of, of what, what uh, you know, crypto and NFT is really all about, and that's profit and money. Yeah, and I, I definitely think that the idea of profit and money is what's what's spearheading it. I think with the way that Dredd and I are thinking about it through the art world is through a social uh, political space of, of finding solidarity. Um, and again, that could be a utopic idea. You know, this maybe this that you know maybe there will be a couple of projects that have you know success, whatever that means, with you know in quotation marks. But I definitely think that it's something that you know again, it's, as I said, I'm I'm I was experimenting. I'm trying to figure out a new way of of understanding and um, and challenging, you know, the current space that I live in, and that we all live in, in terms of a, a societal capitalist um, endeavor, and so to to kind of play with it, like I'm just I'm I'm in it right now, which is playing with like life in general. But like, what does that that mean in the future? I'm not sure. Um, and, and I keep on always thinking about like sustainability, like what how do we sustain this? So. Um, yeah, it's it's one that um, you know we're taking steps forward, but you know I'm hoping it doesn't take us back as well. You know, using the the language of of, of dance, you know, moving moving forward is how I always want to kind of consider um, you know challenging space and thinking about new future possibilities. So it's it's a, it's a risk and a chance that I'm taking and learning the new dance. How cheesy that is. Um. I think one of the last questions I'd like to ask just before we hand it over is in navigating, you know, the, the entire process from, you know, getting wallets to minting to, you know, the communities that you've encountered. Um, are there ways in which you've discovered that the technology itself has is designed in racist ways in the sense that 
you know, artists have explored the way photography and film itself had racial qualities the way it had been developed and, you know, let alone the way in which Polaroid supported apartheid, right? Like, I mean, but just, I'm wondering if that has been an encounter you've had or whether really it is a more social issue in the space. Well, I think the binaries that exist, you know, are, are within the, the, the binaries of capitalism, right? That those that within that system itself that we are, we're inherently have, you know, again, we're talking about accessibility, privilege, you know, like class, like it, it, it creates those steps. And that's something that I think is, is you know, goes back to just the idea of, of, of revenue and, 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 and money. And within that, I think there is a, a fracture to, to not in, be inclusive of everybody. And I think the other element, and it's sort of a, it's woven into the technical implementation right now, but it is sort of, it's not an intentionally racist thing, but the fact that it is so energy intensive. And, um, you know, I know, Brendan, you, your, your project was supposed on a, a green platform. I would love to hear you talk more about that, because the thing is, with, with there are only a couple different blockchains, Ethereum being one of them, that can actually support NFT creation. Um, and it, it, the way Ethereum is currently implemented, you basically have to solve the algorithm in order to write, write to the blockchain, which is a proof of work model, which means that, that there's a lot of energy that's involved in that. And for communities of color, global change, I mean, global climate change is, is affecting basically it's affecting the poor far more adversely than it's affecting the rich, particularly in, in you know, small nations, but also in, you know, big countries like the United States. There's, I mean, somebody just basically fired up a new coal plant to start minting uh, uh, Bitcoin. And so to mine, sort of mine Bitcoin. And so there was an offline coal plant that's now been brought back online because it's a cheaper form of energy. And there's no um, sort of, you know, the, the externalities, the costs of actually polluting and killing the people in the area is not something that the people who are running the crypto mine have to account for in their bottom line. And so there are ways in which a technology that is based upon an energy intensive um, uh, model is actually racist, but it's not sort of racist the same, perhaps the same way as you know, some of the things we, we think about when we talk about you know, how other art forms and technology, you know, when, when you know, Kodak centered its film so that black people would be ink spots as opposed to centering it on white people to make them look normal as it were. Um, yeah, I, and I agree that you know the, the environmental concerns are, are are real and gas fees and gas waste and so part of my 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 drop was to kind of think about that where percentage you know goes towards um, sustaining and uh, going to to grow trees and specifically in Kenya where I'm from to kind of like to kind of create like a more sustainable environmental framework but again like you know uh, there's so much more to be done within that that space but it was definitely something that was was on my mind because I'm like you know socially and politically I also have to be aware of that 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 space and I think that's something that you know us as contemporary artists are always you know re-evaluating rethinking and so that was a big part of of the, of the project as well. I think it's, I mean, to your point, I think it's worth noting that in these carbon offsets uh, markets, most of the places where you can get credits from are from uh, places that are poor and whether that's here in the US or around the world. Um, and there's, there's a racism inherent in the way in which people have been positioned and geographically located and so forth. Um, there's so much so to talk about, but I know that there's questions from the, from the audience. And so I will bow out here um, and let everyone else get to ask you some questions. Thank you so much, Brendan and Dredd. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brendan and Dredd and Charlotte. Uh, there is indeed so much more to talk about, but um, yeah, let's open it up to some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Um, first, I would like to pass the mic over to Sorry, just one moment. Uh, Juno, I'm going to pass you the mic to uh, ask the question shared in the chat. Okay, I was not expecting to be unmuted. Um, no worries though. I was at my, my work desk. My question um, to the speakers 
because it's something that I hear a lot in sort of my circles when talking about NFTs, at least in the idyllic sense, is that the medium when used by artists affords them an opportunity to make some kind of um, royalty in the reselling or forward trading of the work. Um, and I was wondering if that's of interest to um, Dredd or Brandon when they were creating their own NFTs and if that's something that influenced their decision or if they're concerned about that aspect at all because I'm not I'm personally not sure how how big of a royalty value it would bring to the artists themselves well I sold a white dude I don't think they can be resold I think once you buy one you got to keep it uh, <laughs> No, I, so the the royalties and resale value is something that I think is one of the real positive aspects of NFTs. And it's actually more a social question than a smart contract question. Within within the NFT architecture, um, you can the smart contract can be such that it stipulates a percentage of, of the value would be given to the artist automatically if the work is resold. Um, and artists can pick that number anywhere between zero and, and 100%. And typically what's picked is 10%. Um, the issue, there are two issues with that. One is that if work is sold off chain, which says like, let's say I buy an NFT from Brandon um, and then I'm like, oh man, I got this thing for, for 0.1 ETH and now it's worth 100 ETH, I'm gonna go sell it, but I don't wanna give Brendan a, like 10%, I don't wanna do that. So I just go give it to my friend and then he gives me a bunch of cash or you know even Bitcoin or whatever. And then I can gift the thing to their wallet. And so it, it avoids the smart contract and that is possible to do, which gets to the legal question in the United States in US law, um, if you own an object, you can do whatever you want with that object. And so if I buy some artwork, um, that's real physical art, I don't have to give an artist a resale fee. And even if I've signed a contract that says I should do that, it's hard to, to enforce that. But the thing is that with NFTs sort of setting it up so that it's socially custom, social custom to have artists get a resale percentage, that's shifted the conversation where both with, with NFTs and in the, the actual world, people are starting to think, oh yeah, we shouldn't perhaps, you know, just screw over artists. Maybe we should actually, maybe they're an important part of the e art ecosystem. And if I'm flipping some artwork and I made a million dollars, maybe I can give the artists a hundred thousand and I'll be, I'll still be okay. Yeah, and I think that's exactly where I, I, I fit in as well. You know, the, the system of kind of giving back uh, through resale um, within the NFT, but also trying to make that structure become something that is available in the art world. Like you see a lot of artists, you know, work go into secondary market on the, in the auction world and the artist is always cut out. And so I think this is a system that kind of really reevaluates um, the artist's position, the artist's labor, the artist's, um, um, you know, conceptual um, idea that the artist is still part of the work. So I think if it can be implemented in other ways, not necessarily just in doing the NFT sale or the mint, um, uh, but also within the art world and the secondary uh, market as we continue to see the work move on. Excellent, well, thank you both so much. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic now to our friend, Lynn Crawford. Lynn, you can turn on your mic now. Thank you. This has been really interesting and really puzzling for my brain. Um, I, I think I understand the pros and cons of, of this, but what I'm trying to grapple with here is what do you think fuels it so powerfully? Well, I think initially it was, it's money. You know, I think it's this idea of like people can make fast money. And I think that was something that I was like, I don't want to think that I'm just doing this for money. For me, it's also a conceptual process um, and another medium. But I think there's this, there's this thing where you hear about like, you know, um, certain NFTs going on sale and people were like, what is this? It kind of, it kind of created this, this buzz that, you know, this is a way to make money. You know, our friends were like saying to me like, well, I want to make one in the music world and I want to do this. And, you know, I went to Art Basel and, you know, I was just having like 
you know, like, like walking around and you could just hear people talking about crypto and saying metaverse and asking all these questions. And it was just like, it was like, um, there was like this buzz, you know? So that's what I mean, it, it's on a high, but I think it, it really stems from the idea of, of revenues in the beginning of, of uh, in, in the beginning, um, that's I think that what, what, what was fueling it. Mm. Yeah, I think it's basically get rich quick schemes. And that's, you know, that's <laughs> what, what people were excited about. It's like, hey, it's the art lottery ticket or whatever. And and so, yeah, that, and, you know, again, I don't begrudge any artist that, you know, can retire off of, you know, one or a couple NFTs, but it's like, that's, if that's the motivation, that's something that is not what has historically mostly been motivating most artists. I mean, I'm sure artists want to have money and I'm sure artists would love to trade their commodities that they make for money or their performances for money. But it was not like we got up in the morning and said, hey, I'm going to take a, you know, photograph of the, you know, I don't know, whatever, El Capitan, or I'm going to do a dance. And then I'm going to sell this for a million dollars and then I'm going to retire. That's not, that's not why artists make most of our art, even if we hope to make money with it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't have any illusion that that's how I survive. I sell artwork. I get grants to make artwork and many of my friends do, but it's a different thing when you think, Ooh, what's an NFT? I'm at Art Basel. Oh, everything's selling. Maybe I could, Hey, I don't know what it is, but can I get one? Where can I get one of these? And it's like, Oh wait, I, he, he sold for $2 million. Maybe I could be 3 million or even only half. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's not what people should be concerned about with art. That shouldn't be the first conversation. It sounds like a dancing with the devil. <laughs> I wonder if I, if it's all right, I would just like to put in my two cents here. Sure, too. please. Yeah. Um, I find it helpful to think about uh, Raymond Williams had this notion of the structure of feeling and yeah. how objects and technologies come to stand for things that are desired in the larger yeah. culture. And so I'll just share that I think to the larger social question you're asking, I've been thinking a lot about how the rhetorical terms um, become, uh, represent certain fantasies of what doesn't actually exist there. And so whether in the society overall, you know, before the blockchain conversation happened, well, what, we not, what did we not have that this thing now comes to try and give us? Yeah. It may not do it right or well or at all, but it comes to stand for that. Um, and I, I find that helpful, at least in my own thinking, as I'm trying to answer a similar type of question. Um, and on this note, I would just add, I think one of the things that's dangerous in this space is this type of techno fetishism. Um, I, I would point out that both Dread and Brendan's projects came out last fall, and there was a social political conversation around blockchain that was starting to happen last fall. And then all of a sudden everyone became obsessed with screens and the quality of the screen technology and, and seeing them on good quality screens and the way in which over and over again, when we try and have these conversations, they get, they, they seem to disappear under the waves of techno fetishism. Um, sorry, I just had to put that in there. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, all three of you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you, Lynn, for that question. Um, in the interest of time, we're, we're going to take one more question. I am passing the mic over to GE Schwartz. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Nick and, and Anya, and, and of course, the panel. I, you know, I can't come to any of these kind of conversations without thinking of Walter Benjamin's uh, great yeah. essay, you know, the, the work of art and the the age of mechanical reproduction and thinking about reproductions and their attractiveness and their interest and talk about fetishism and things. Can we discuss a little tiny bit about the difference between the power of an original work of art versus maybe the enchantment of an NFT and how we might be attracted to the means of production for those, those two items? Thank you. Uh, I'll say a little bit, uh, and maybe I'm on a bit of a rant, uh, but within my NFT, it was an algorithm that kept, kept on creating. So when you bought, when you, when you like purchased or minted the, the, the NFT, you don't know what you're getting. And that was something that, uh, you know, the algorithm created. And then there's certain rarities, uh, certain things that 
attributes that are more rare if they move it has an animation it becomes more rare so for me it was almost like buying baseball cards when i picked a you know buy a pack of baseball cards and i opened it as a child and i got the rookie card or the hologram it was sort of or yeah some sort of cracker jack box you know it was this kind of <laughs> kind of thing and that was something that was really like you know because there's only one within the thousand there's always going to be within the whole mint there's a thousand but there'll always be originals and that was something that people were were, were excited about but also were were frustrated about. They're like, I want to be able to pick mine. I want that one. Um, and that was something I was like, well, you can't. And they were like, oh, well, this is something that I don't want to do because I really want that one. And that was something that came up a lot in the conversation of when I was trying to explain the, the, the NFT mint and the algorithm and the kind of ideas of different attributes. So within it, there is an originality, uh, you know, again, you know, when I make print editions, you know, people are like, I don't want the print, I rather have the one off. And so it was kind of playing again cheekily in that space that, you know, yes, there's a thousand, but there's also, they're all originals and some are more rare than others. And that was just a conversation that I thought was interesting um, within um, this NFT space. Yeah, and I think this thing of, of you know the excitement the buzz about nfts is you know which brendan's been talking a lot about is i think a lot of what people are interested in i mean i i think that sometimes honestly i suspect people don't even look at the nfts that they buy i mean it's just like i got that i own this and it's not even that they're interested in the aesthetic but they're interested in the the commodification and the technology um and so you know i i and in a weird way, I'm glad to see that people are talking about screens because that may, might mean people are actually looking at these things, <laughs> um, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I think that the excitement and buzz is about the tech as opposed to the underlying art. And I, I do think that as an artist, I mean, and, you know, I mean, yes, seeing say a painting in real life is important, but I don't think that that's more important than say, a video that is infinitely reproducible. In fact, I think that one of the the things that is sort of behind some of this argument about the creation of NFTs is that digital artwork, whether it's a video or, a, or still image that exists in a computer is infinitely reproducible. And so I could send a JPEG to somebody and it could be exactly like the JPEG I still you know, have on my laptop. It's an exact copy of it. And then they're trying to figure out how can how can the artist or how can somebody make profit off the ownership of the supposedly unique one, and and you know whereas I think with you know my white male for sale in a certain sense I think the conceptual artwork the, there's there is a unique one that somebody owns now somebody owns white male for sale, but the the fact that it the video could potentially be shared and the concept and the, the of that being at an auction can be shared that doesn't devalue the work and it doesn't make that it is, you know, you, you don't have to see quote unquote, the original, where you might have to see the original Mona Lisa or whatever. But I, I think that the, the art, you know, there are new kinds of artwork that, um, you know, they are digital and, and it, the, the uniqueness is not the essential thing. Um, and I, I don't think we should try and go back to a time where you'd have to see, well, I have to see the video projected from Dred Scott's computer, as opposed to, no, it's all the same. You just see it. And then there's the conceptual artwork. And, and yes, it was sold as an NFT and encoded onto the blockchain. Thank you. Well, thank you, GE. And um, once again, I just, I want to thank you so much, Dred, and Brendan, and Charlotte for joining us today and for this conversation. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, but we here at The Rail have a tradition of ending our conversations with a poetry reading. And I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the day, Shanika McIntosh to our stage. Poet and performer Shanika McIntosh creates interdisciplinary work inspired by the Black uh, diaspora. She aims to disrupt and confront historical colonial erasure, utilizing the thematic palettes of dislocation, trauma, migration, climate crisis, and Afrofuturism. Her debut chapbook, Spiral as Ritual, was released last December by Topos Press. And without further ado, um, Shanika, over to you. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to the Brooklyn Rail for inviting me um, here today. This was a very 
um, illuminating conversation that touched on a lot of thoughts that I've been having to myself <laughs> in my brain. And I feel like, um, yeah, it just felt really special to be here. Um, I've been, I think a lot of people, especially artists are curious about NFTs and the NFT conversation and um, accessibility to that seems really um, a major issue. So it was really great to hear from both perspectives that overlapped and differed in um, interesting ways. So I'm Shanika and um, I'm a poet and I'm a first generation American. My whole family is actually from Jamaica and my practice really in this book really deals with this kind of split in identity of being raised, um, you know, Jamaican um, in American soil, but also this inherited um, history of African Americans. Um, and so from an early age, I've always been curious about the like connections of uh, between the diaspora um, and how that has been erased um, and just the continued um, investigation of that. Um, and this book tries to explore the intersections of passivity and action, apathy and empathy, and you know the dehumanizing capacities of capitalism, specifically on black and brown bodies. Um, and yeah, that's what this book is. So I'm gonna read um, and I'll spiral this ritual. What possesses you? Me, I, her. Waves outside hit the boat, a silent rush to be here, yet far lately. What possesses you? Prisoners to construct, dredging up old wounds and self-pity, does that make her more likable to be vulnerable or seen? Hold up your reflection onto mine and call it yours. Breaking out of the bondage of history, karmic retribution broke the road paved and inheritance. To ignore and sit blissfully, silencing, she's watched, homes sold and remade into the image of a corrupt prophet situated on self-indulgence and pleasure. And yet, what possesses you? The sun beams in from the abyss, the curvature of the mountains, pink hue streaked across cerulean sky, fades into an incomplete. Here she stood, dreams and desires of her own, dreams, desires of mine, leaving behind family, friends, and history. Here she stared at the mountains, at the peace, at the calm, Promise for me and mine, filled with opportunity and stability, swept away abruptly like waves. Here I lay on the ground as I watched slowly, the waves freeze into ice and melt into water again. Here she cried as the American dream slapped her in the face, the lie as she grew old and saw the industry fade. Here I see progress, a promise fulfilled, but not for me and mine. She sits and watches this landscape twist and turn to the betterment of the, the others as I watch my children, their children seemingly lose a place she carved. I watch as they are only offered condescending platitudes and giving only a clenched fist to shake hands, pity. Here I watch you choke on your false idols of farm to table, ugly pastiches aligned to money. You lie to yourself and me. You talk of bridges and of non-existent opportunities of freshly restored wood floors. She's not mad. I'm not mad. You mad? What possesses you? Prisoners to construct. Dredging up old wounds and self-pity. Does that make her more likable? To be vulnerable or be seen. Stay holding up your reflection onto hers and call it yours. Break out of bondage to history. Break out of karmic retribution, the road kept for us by our ancestors reject an inheritance, break, silence, listen, extend the hand open or not. To unravel yourself from the soft embrace, I throw myself into the river, hit my head on a small smooth pebble and laugh uncontrollably. I lay on my back in the grass, my eyes close as I swallow myself to be swallowed up, allow myself to be swallowed up. Finally, peace. Tender rage. 
You've taught her to fear, to breed, to oppress herself. What will happen to her now? She who's no longer desirable beyond corruptible, the Jezebel and then the Mammy. Will her fury still shock you? She gave you everything. She sold herself. How did she become mine, yours, ours? Stay stoic. Sometimes I think about her, only in a fleeting minute, only on the way, pity to that girl, shocked into an existence with the rules set against her. Do you even think about her, only when she suits your needs, dredging up old wounds and self-pity? Does that make her more likable to be seen, vulnerable, to have signs of weakness? Stay holding up your reflection onto hers and calling it yours. Damn, such shame for that girl. At least you're not that girl. Now woman, now lifeless, now obsolete. She's your girl, your emptiness. Hunger, feeding others when you can't even feed yourself. Hunger, no sleep. Hunger, no food in the fridge. Hunger, only you in the silence of the night and the discomfort of the body. Sown time, tale of contents. The abyss, listing limitlessly, misspoke desire to find a twine, etched into fingertips, fingerprint rituals and complexities. Communion leads into a corner. Within this light, there is no darkness, there is no way to see light or way. Thoughtlessly looking for a song, the heart's temptation to the, avoid the minds, wandering, remaining. To invoke methods, systems, tools of domination, she looked into herself, wailing and screeching her sorrow, for which no one could care, she looked to me knowing. We are unwill unwilling to emulate our conveniences, positions. We clearlessly endanger and soldier on step to step. A responsibility unwanted but required. She chuckles whispers, is there no more perfect way to dictate this collapse, soldiering but shielding and washing away your responsibility? Humiliated by her existence, forebears and progeny, she catalyzes searching, a turn of phrase that betrays something, a stage, a loss irreproachable to think, hear and will be. Routine brings comfort and safety. Sacrificed humanity made long due, not mine, I've had nothing to lose. Fair you see is that the mere possibility of my routine shaken remains unimaginable, not unheard of, but not something to be reached. Drenched and suffocated in the aura of respectability, for instance, is it not uncouth now for me to scream loudly, angrily in other similes? Insert here other various detailed expression of my unbridled black rage. Should I write it again? Say it again over and over and over, writing the story of mine's and hers. Let me say it again. What possesses you, prisoners to construct, dredging up old wounds and self pity? Does that make her more likable to be vulnerable or be seen, holding up your reflection onto hers and calling it yours? Breaking out of the bondage of history, the karmic retribution, a road paid for us by our ancestors, an inheritance to ignore by sitting blissfully in silence. Um, I believe I should stop here because it's 10 minutes, right? Um, thank you. Thank you so, so much, Shanika, um, for, for your reading, for sharing your poetry with us today. Um, there, a reminder for everyone in the audience, there is a link to Shanika's book, a Spiral as Ritual, in the chat. So please check that out. Um, I once again want to thank you so much, uh, Brendan, Dredd, and Charlotte, for your conversation today. I'd like to thank uh, the team at Kristen Tierney Gallery for helping to make the event possible. Uh, we encourage everyone to view this archive of conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for a conversation with Carol Szymanski and Amanda Gulibitsi on the occasion of Szymanski's exhibition at Signs and Symbols. We conclude with a poetry reading by Chiso Lee. And you now can all turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye. And uh, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank so you. Take thank care. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great conversation today. Wonderful Thank poetry you. reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shakela, for the beautiful reading also. Wow.
Amazing. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. I'm learning so much about this new art form. <laughs> it's really intense. It's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Dred, also on your last show. It was Thank a great you. interview. It was great. Thanks. Yeah, the interview was good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it was really terrific. Keep up our good work. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah. Thank you, Dred. Thank you, Brandon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, let's go to have lunch. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up the good work, okay? Much okay. love to with you guys. Thank you, Sakena. Stay safe. Take Thank care. you, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you, you guys. Bye.